I'm just like too dead inside. This had me by the throat. So freaking cute. I literally just like got a chill on my spine thinking about it. I am not a squee, kick your feet type of person. Loved it. Oh my God, I wanted to punch this man. And you just want to squeeze the life out of it. Hi, I'm Sam. There's quite literally no one asking me to do this, but I would like to tell you all about the best books that I read in 2023. So before we get into the books, I really do just want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank everyone who has stuck with me from the very beginning. And I know there are a lot of new people here from Kayla's video. So I really want to thank everyone for joining. I hope you like what you see. Yeah, I think this is kind of perfect timing because now you can see a lot of books that I really like from this video. And I also just had my worst of video that came out last week. So if you happen to love all of those books, then we might not be very compatible book besties. But if you like a lot of the books that are on this list or are intrigued by a lot of the books on this list, sorry, you're stuck with me. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm glad that we're here together. That's enough mushy gushy stuff. Now let's get into my best books of the year. So as I did with my worst books, I have ranked these painstakingly. I don't understand why people don't like to do it. I understand the difficulty, but for me, it's like there's a certain level of satisfaction that comes with ranking. So I'm going to start with number 23 and then we're going to work our way up to number one, my best book of the year. So the first book on this list is Cult Classic by Sloane Crosley. This one I read early on in the year and this was one where when I read it and set it down, I was like, yeah, that was pretty good. And it stuck with me a lot more than I thought it would. So this is about a woman in New York City who one night runs into an ex-boyfriend. So it seems innocuous enough. And then each day after that, she keeps running into all of her ex-boyfriends. And as this is happening, we are learning more about her past relationships and how they are maybe informing her current relationship. And then there's this subplot where some of her former coworkers are in this cult. It seems like they're trying to pull the main character into the cult. So this was just really weird and really funny and like I said it stuck with me a lot more than I thought it would when I was putting this list together and I was looking through my books I was like oh cult classic yeah I want to put that on there so if you're a weird girly you'll probably like this one next is a series so I'm kind of cheating but this is my channel and I make the rules so that is PTSD radio by Masaki Nakayama I don't know how I went so long without knowing this series existed because this is right up my alley super super good and the reason it's so far down on the list is because it is pretty formulaic. So there are three omnibus volumes and by the last volume, it's like, you kind of know what's going to happen, but it scratches that horror manga itch. And the entire series is a collection of short stories based on Japanese folk tales and folk horror and different yokai. So it's just super fun, super, super fun. It's one of those series where even if it's not really doing anything super groundbreaking in terms of story, the art is just super cool cool to look at and it's cool to learn about other cultures, monsters that lurk under their bed. Next, we have another one that when I first read it and set it down, I was like, yeah, that was pretty good, but I wasn't sure how much it would stick with me, but it has really just worked its way into my brain. And I think about it a lot more than I thought I would. So that is Astral Season Beastly Season by Tahi Saihate and translated by Kalau Almany. This is about two high school boys in Japan and they are obsessed with this J-pop idol. And within like the first couple pages, it's established that the idol has been arrested for murdering and butchering her boyfriend. And these two boys are so obsessed with her and this image that they have constructed of her that they cannot accept that she would do something so awful. So what they do is they set out and start murdering people in a similar fashion to try and convince the police and maybe even themselves that the idol wasn't the one who killed her boyfriend and it was actually them. So this was a really wacky, dark exploration of fandom culture and I just had a great time with it. I want to read you one excerpt because I think it really illustrates the dark side of fandom culture and how toxic masculinity and sexism can really inform male fans, especially male fans who are fans of women entertainers. So it's these two high school boys and they're discussing what they like about the idol whose name is Mami-chan. Morishita, what do you like about Mami-chan? I like that she's cute and a good dancer, but she's just practicing as hard as she can. She doesn't have any talent. That's what's best about her. I get that. That's why you're great, because you have absolutely no talent, no sense, and yet you work so hard to act like you do, despite your inferiority complex. Your favorite food, your favorite music, it's all so normal, 
so you're proud of anything that's slightly different about yourself. It's that attitude, that pathetic attempt to be even just a little bit better than others that I love. What I mean is you're sad and pathetic, so I can look down on you however much I want. So really interesting exploration of fandom culture, what it means to be a fan, how two people who can be diehard fans of the same thing can be fans in such different ways. So yeah, this one really, really, really has been a little earworm in my brain and I think you should read it. Next, we have Monstrilio by Gerardo Samano Cordova. This this is kind of like a Frankenstein retelling. This is about a couple who loses their son and the mother cannot accept his death. So what she does is she carves out a piece of his lung and because of this folktale that she hears, she nurtures the lung in the hopes that it will kind of keep her son alive or bring him back to life. And the nurtured lung eventually transforms into this little monster that she names Monstrilio. And as the monster is nurtured more and more by the family, he begins to resemble their son more and more. But as he's trying to fit more and more into this mold of a boy, it becomes harder and harder for him to resist his carnivorous urges and his monstrous urges. So really, really beautiful, melancholic exploration of grief and how being unable to let go of loved ones after they die can have really catastrophic effects. So one of the most melancholy reads I've ever read and it was just really, really beautiful. So you should read this guys. Next, we have Big Swiss by Jen Vegan. This was really funny. This one seems really polarizing, like people either really love it or really hate it. Was this doing anything extremely groundbreaking? No. Is this writing like the best I've ever read in my life? No, but I just liked it. <laughs> This was one book where I think I read it right when I needed it and I was in the exact right mood for it. So I definitely understand why people wouldn't love this book or why it would kind of fall flat for some people. But for me, it was just funny. I laughed out loud actually when I was reading this multiple times and that happens very rarely in books. So this is about a woman who is a transcriptionist for a sex coach. The sex coach is really funny. He's wildly inappropriate. Greta is the transcriptionist. She's a really weird lady, just a very bizarre woman and she begins transcribing sessions for this woman that she nicknames Big Swiss and Big Swiss is a married woman but she talks about some past trauma that she endured and this makes Greta really intrigued by her and then Greta happens to run into Big Swiss at a dog park and that sort of even further deepens her interest in Big Swiss. She ends up striking up a friendship and eventually a sexual relationship with Big Swiss and it is just freaking weird. If you're just feeling like you're in a silly goofy weird mood you could maybe try this and you might like it. Next is Open Throat by Henry Hoke. This is one that I originally listened to on audiobook and it's very short. So I listened to it in a single sitting and this just captured my heart. It was very witty and funny and sad and another very melancholic read. So this is about a queer mountain lion who lives under the Hollywood sign. I think a real strength of this story is when we get the mountain lion's perspective on humans and how humans behave. It's just so funny. And then it says, when a man-made fire engulfs the encampment, the lion is forced from the hills down into the city the hikers call LA. As the lion confronts a carousel of temptations and threats, they take us on a tour that spans the cruel inequalities of Los Angeles and the toll of climate grief. But even when salvation finally seems within reach, they are forced to face down the ultimate question. Do they want to eat a person or become one? So definitely on par with Monstrilio for me for one of the most melancholy reads I read this year, but still very funny. There were a couple times where I chuckled out loud. Okay, next we are going to talk about a Junji Ito release. We had a really good year for Junji Ito releases. So Tombs by Junji Ito. So I think the strongest story in this collection was Washed Ashore and it's really only a few pages. It's quite short, but a lot of it reminded me a lot of his older works. It kind of reminded me of a mixture between Uzumaki and Gyo. We also finally get a physical US release of one of his most famous stories, which is Slug Girl. So that's really exciting. It just feels good to be getting into some of his new work and loving it just as much as I've loved the first thing I've read of his. Okay, and then next we have another Junji Ito release that is Mimi's Tales of Terror. This one edged Tombs out just by a little bit. And I think what I loved about this is that all of these stories were brand new to me. I had never read them before. So kind of the novelty might have been what edged Tombs out. But this is about a woman named Mimi and we are following her. There's sort of this like negative continuity where each story stands alone, but Mimi is the protagonist in all of these stories and she is encountering all these weird happenings in her town in a very Junji Ito-esque way. One of the stories in this collection called Seashore stood out to me because often when Junji Ito has one of his page turn
turning scares. It's very clear what the scare is and you can sort of just marvel at the detail of this monstrous thing that has been shown to you. But in Seashore, there is a page turner where we're just looking out at the ocean at night. And I think it's the first time, at least that I know of, that he has had a page turner where there's not a clear scare. And I found myself sort of scanning and like looking with painstaking effort to see if there was any sort of little tiny scare or tiny entity out in the ocean that I was supposed to pick up on. And being prompted to do that made the reading experience even more tense for me. It's kind of like when you're watching a horror movie and there's this really dark shot and your eyes are trying to see if there's any sort of scary thing lurking in the darkness that you should be picking up on to prepare you for a jump scare. It was that same kind of energy and that same sort of feeling of dread and anxiety and rising tension. We're getting some of the best he's ever created. So you should pick this up. Okay, next is another one that's kind of like Big Swiss where I had a whale of a time. So that is Patricia Wants to Cuddle by Samantha Allen. This is about a cast who are on like a bachelor-esque dating show. And the finale is set on this remote mountainside, kind of like Pacific Northwest-ish area. And we're getting shifting perspective between the finalist female contestants. And we also get some point of view of the staff who work on like the production team. And the contestants are starting to get picked off by something or someone in the woods. So this was one of the few instances where I think a story pulls off horror and humor together really well. That's normally a combination I'm very critical of. I think the humor for me was the best part, but there were some really awesome scenes of gore as well. So I really, really recommend this one. It's a silly, goofy, gory time. Next is one I have not picked up yet because the paperback edition has not been released yet. And I am, I really am not a hardcover girly. So that is Walking Practice by Dolkey Min and translated by Victoria Cottle. So this is about an extraterrestrial entity who has crash landed on earth after a catastrophic event that has potentially wiped out all of their race or species in the universe. So they are trying to survive on earth and in order to feed themselves, they are using dating apps to meet people and they have the ability to shapeshift. So what they do is shapeshift into whatever their dating matches ideal type is and they go out and meet the match or go on a date and then they eat them. Again, this was also very melancholy, very contemplative, very sad. And a lot of this book is about this alien really struggling to physically contort themselves into a version of a being that will be liked and accepted by these people. I think framing it as being necessary for this alien to survive is really cool commentary on how we feel like we have to conform and fit into these certain molds and check these certain boxes in order to be palatable by people or to be liked or to even be accepted and to be safe. You know, a lot of people have to change who they are and present themselves differently in order to just not to have their life threatened. I think it's really timely commentary and yeah, it was very melancholy and very sad, but also very funny. You know, it's this alien who is not familiar with Earth's customs. So a lot of what the alien had to say was very funny. And again, a lot of really great gore. I loved how this ended too. This was another one where I didn't think this one would stick with me as much as it did. But while I was making this list, I was like, okay, walking practice absolutely has to go on here. Okay, next is another one I also do not have yet. That is Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. Pick this one up kind of on a whim. I knew this was gonna be like sad girl lit, but. I I wasn't expecting for this to hit so close to home. <laughs> as it did. So this is about a woman who has an unnamed mental illness. And for most of her life, while we're with her, it's completely undiagnosed. So she doesn't even know what it is. She just can sense that there's something wrong with her. And it's a lot of these sentiments of, I wish that I could just get better. I want to get better. And why am I like this? Why can't I just function normally like other people? So a lot of those sentiments really resonated with me. Really, really great combination of humor while still having sort of these like gut punching revelations about what it means to be a mentally ill person and struggling to explain what that's like and how much of a struggle it can be to someone who is not sick. Next we have one that's like, okay, yeah, of course this is on a best list because it's a freaking masterpiece. So that is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. So we're following this occult scholar who is trying to prove that haunted houses are real and ghosts are real. And he recruits these individuals to help him. We have Theodora who is 
is kind of just there because she thinks it's going to be fun. Luke is the heir of Hill House. Eleanor is a strange and lonely woman, and she is selected because she has had previous so-called experiences with the supernatural. So we're following these characters as they are interacting with this house, and the house very much feels like a character all on its own. Very atmospheric, very creepy, very dread-inducing, and the longer these people spend in Hill House, the more the house starts to affect them in different ways, so super, super solid. There is a reason this is a classic, guys. This is a masterpiece. Okay, next we have a book by Samantha Schweblin. That is Little Eyes, and this was translated again by Megan McDowell. Samantha Schweblin is kind of a girl boss. She really does not miss for me. This is speculative fiction wherein there are these little devices called Kentucky, which act very much like an Alexa. They are dressed as these cute little stuffed animals and are almost more like a companion. And the other difference is that for every person who has a Kentucky, there is another person somewhere in the world who has a connection code for the Kentucky. And the person with a connection code is actually the one who is controlling the Kentucky. So really, really interesting exploration of how much people will sacrifice privacy, security, in order to feel just a little bit of connection. And I am definitely very, probably a little too afraid of Big Brother and, you know, FBI agents listening to me on my phone, that kind of thing. So this book was really freaky for me in particular. So I think if you share similar fears, you would probably really like this book. Next, we have something a little different. This is definitely not in my normal wheelhouse. This is a romance, but it is a romance manga. And there's just something so sweet about it. It's like that kind of cute rage you get when you see a cute animal and you just want to squeeze the life out of it. That's how I felt reading this. So that is my love mix up. <laughs> the story is written by Wataru Hinekure and the art is by Aruko. Guys, this made me like actually believe that there was a reason for living, you know, like there is good in humanity. Not everything is awful. So freaking wholesome and cute. Okay, we start out with a small cast of characters. Aoki has a crush on Hashimoto. So he's like, hey, can I borrow your eraser? She's like, sure. She lends it to him. He's working, he's working, and then he drops it. And the guy in front of him, Ida, picks it up for him. But it's one of those that has like a little cover on it and the cover has slipped off. And on it is his name with a heart next to it. So a lot to unpack here. It means Hashimoto has a crush on him, but it came off of Aoki's desk. So Ida thinks that Aoki has a crush on him. And then Aoki doesn't want to like out Hashimoto. So he just goes along with it and is like, yeah, I have a crush on you. And oh, the freaking like love dynamics are just so freaking cute. I cannot handle it. This had me like squeeing, kicking my feet. I do not do that. I am not a squee, kick your feet type of person. I'm just like too dead inside. But this brought me back to life. I cannot recommend this series enough. It's so cute. It's completed. It's only like nine volumes. It's so freaking wholesome and cute. I could go on and on. Please read this, please please. Okay, now we're back to the dark stuff. I know you guys were probably worried there for a second, but don't worry. We are back to the dark stuff. So next is Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. I had previously read Convenient Store Woman by Sayaka Murata, and it was like, it was fine, you know, but this is Mm -hmm. This is more for me. This is about a woman who grows up, feels very alien, very other in her family, like she doesn't belong. And as a child, she has this fantasy that she's not actually of this world and she's actually an alien. And she's waiting to be rescued by her people from space. So it's very sad. We have a lot of these entries that very starkly show how left out of society and her family this girl feels. I was used to mom saying I was hopeless and she was right, I really was a dead loss. The rice I dished up just lay flat in the bowl instead of being nicely mounded. Look how messy that is. Just to let Yuri take over. Such a clumsy child, mom sighed. That's not true, she's doing very well, an aunt said, flattering me. I carried on serving the rice as best I could hoping nobody else would call me a loser. She's like a freaking girl. So it's just like, man, I wanna take this weird little child under my wing and tell her everything's gonna be okay. We start out with her as a child and then we flash forward to when she's an adult and it's very weird and it takes a very violent turn by the end. This has a lot of weird, icky stuff going on. Yep, you should read this if you're a weird horror girly. I'm telling you, you're gonna like it. Okay, next is one that I have categorized as the most disturbing book I've ever read. I still Stand by that. This to this day just is so icky. It's so icky. So that is Tampa by Alyssa Nutting. This is about a woman who becomes a middle school teacher for the purpose of grooming and sexually abusing young boys. And we are from the point of view of the teacher. Ugh, I'm like, I literally just like got chilled on my spine thinking about it. 
we get very painstaking detail about this woman's fantasies and there are very graphic scenes of the abuse, but this was written so masterfully that it's equal parts disturbing and absurd. And there were even parts where I actually laughed while reading this. And I kind of felt like I was going crazy. I'm like, why am I laughing? I just think it's a testament to Alyssa Nutting's writing that she can sort of push it so much that it bleeds over into this absurd territory. And I will say this became even more disturbing to me after I finished it and realized that this was loosely based on a real case and a real life person. So this is not one you're gonna wanna recommend to your grandma. Next is a short story. And you know me, I'm not a short story girly really, but I think I just don't like short story collections. I'm fine getting into a single story and like single short stories can be super bomb for me. Obviously this is number seven on my best of list. So that is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This was originally published in 1862. And this is about a woman who has just given birth and she is not doing well mentally. So her husband, who is a physician claims that there's nothing really wrong with her. She just needs to go out into the country and get some fresh air. So I've said it before, I'll say it again. If I had been born even 20 years earlier, I would have been burnt at the stake. I'm pretty sure. Either that or like lobotomized immediately. So yeah, this blew me away. I picked this up because it is such a well-loved classic short story, but like, damn. This was very affecting as someone who also struggles with mental illness, some of the sentiments that she was expressing and then some of the conversations that she was having with her husband who clearly didn't believe that she was sick. We're just like, oh my God, I wanted to punch this man. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the notes in here is just, she is me. <laughs> Okay, I don't really wanna to read too much because this is only 15 pages, but just to give you an idea. John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. John is a physician and perhaps, I would not say it to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. Perhaps that is one reason I do not get well faster. You see, he does not believe I am sick. My brother is also a physician and also of high standing and he says the same thing. Why are men? Why are men? Okay, I know this was in 1862, so like there is historical context, but still got the blood boiling. But yeah, this was amazing. This was great. I don't even know, did I finish the synopsis? Can't remember. She just gave birth. She's not feeling well mentally. They're out on this like country estate. She gets shut up in this room by her husband that has this atrocious yellow wallpaper. And the designs in the wallpaper kind of start to drive her crazier and crazier. Phenomenal, guys. You gotta read it. It's only 15 pages, you can do it. Okay, next is another short story. Who is she? I don't know. But this is actually a reread. I read this originally in high school loved it. So I wanted to revisit it this year to see if I liked it still now that my brain has fully formed. And I did, obviously, number six on the list. So that is Hunters in the Snow by Tobias Wolf. I love me a bleak story. I love messy, awful characters. And this has both of those things. So we have three male characters and they're all very different. And they are friends who are meeting up very early in the morning to go out hunting in the snow. Again, this is a short story, but but the characters are just so masterfully crafted because we very quickly get a sense of who they are, what motivates them. They feel very real and tangible. The entire story is really about the character dynamics and how tenuous those dynamics are and how quickly they can shift and how quickly power can shift and how toxic masculinity really hurts men. I love the ending. I love the characters. I love the pacing. It's just pitch perfect. So you really, really, really should check this out. Okay, now we're getting into the top five guys. I think you guys are gonna be surprised at how things have shaken out. Like I'm sure right now you're watching and like those of you who have been watching for a while, you're like, I already know what your top two are gonna be, but we'll see. We will see. Next is Perfect Days by Rafael Montes. I bet you're pretty surprised right about now, huh? You probably thought this was gonna be number one or number two, but it's number five. This was so good, okay? That's not to say that I have changed my mind or feelings about how amazing this book was. That's not the case. I've just read even more bangers and there are some that have stuck with me even more and just clawed their way up to the top. Perfect Days is still fantastic. We are following this young, disturbed med student who meets this woman named Clarice at a barbecue and he becomes obsessed with her. And he ends up hijacking her, kidnapping her and embarking on a dark and delirious road trip. This sounds like a very run of the mill thriller and I am very critical of thrillers, but this had me by the throat. From the first page, did not let up. The ending is very much a Sam ending. I just loved this. This was like high octane, gripping. Please read it, you guys, read it. Next we have Blood Meridian by 
like Cormac McCarthy. This was a masterpiece. This was another one that I went into knowing it was highly beloved. This is like a classic. Read it and I'm like, yeah, that's a classic. I understand. Probably the richest story, most developed, layered story I've ever, ever read. Like this is the type of book that felt like it took a thousand years to write and now we could talk about it and dissect it for a thousand years to come. So this is based on historical events that took place on the Texas-Mexico border in the 1850s. This is a very epic novel that traces the journey of these men who are contracted by the Mexican government to murder indigenous people and bring them their scalps. So this is another one where the characters are so masterfully constructed and you know you could even just like dissect a single character from this for a thousand years in a thousand different ways. So again one of those where a lot has already been said about this. I talked about this pretty extensively in a wrap-up but one word of caution this is the most violent book I've ever read and one thing I mentioned in my wrap-up is I think that that's a real strength of this book because 1850s in the Texas-Mexico border were not a super fun happy time. It really was a lot of these white men going out murdering, raping, pillaging indigenous folks and if Cormac McCarthy had shied away from that and tried to make it more like the classic Hollywood romanticized type western it would have been a disservice to the story. Next we have a play because I am an intellectual just kidding. But that is The Pillow Man by Martin McDonough. Wow. Yeah, this blew me away. You know, I, I obviously don't read a lot of plays, but this was fantastic. And it made me really want to see this play live. So this centers on a writer in an unnamed totalitarian state who is being interrogated about the gruesome content of his short stories and their similarities to a series of child murders. Because the protagonist is a writer, we get to read a lot of his writing. So there's like a bunch of stories within this story. And those stories, were really masterfully done too. So one of those works where I'm in awe that someone is able to write like this, that someone is able to construct a story like this and left me feeling like I will never read anything like that ever again. Okay, top two. Next is Hawk Mountain by Connor Habib. I bet you are surprised again because you thought this was gonna be number one, but this one just barely got edged out. So I have talked about this extensively. This is another one very similar to Perfect Days where it had me by the throat from page one Another one where as I was reading it, I would get so shocked by things happening that I would gasp out loud and exclaim out loud because I just could not believe it. An English teacher is gaslit by his charismatic high school bully in this tense story of deception, manipulation, and murder. Probably the tensest story I've ever read. You're constantly on edge, waiting for something to happen, wondering what's gonna happen. And this was a debut novel too, which just was like, man, Connor Habib is just coming out here freaking swinging, you know? He is not messing around, so. I highly recommend this one. Please read it and let me know if you like it. Okay, my number one book of the year really surprised me, really surprised me, and it might surprise you too, but that is In Praise of the Stepmother by Mario Vargas Llosa. Wow. <laughs> Another one that is unlike anything I've ever read. I'm not sure I'll ever read anything else like it again. It's just so unique. So this is a Peruvian classic and this was translated by Helen Lane. This is a story of Don Rigoberto, his second wife, Lucrezia, and Rigoberto's prepubescent son, Alfonso. Although the group appears to be a happy household, within this small constellation lurk the shadows of perversion and the limitless boundaries of familial passion. So what they're really trying to say is that Lucrezia begins an affair with her stepson. So many, many, many levels of wrongdoing happening here. Kind of similarly to Alyssa Nutting in that the author writes it so masterfully that it crosses over into that realm of absurdity and humor. But what really set this apart for me was that interspersed throughout the chapters, which are very short, are different pieces of art. And I was just blown away by how the art was incorporated into the story story and how in a lot of cases the art itself was what was driving the narrative in that chapter. I've never seen that done before. It was so unique and again unlike anything I've ever read and I actually read this on my first day on a trip in Las Vegas for like the first 12 hours. I was alone. I wasn't able to check into my hotel yet so I was literally sitting in this semi-abandoned food court in a Las Vegas casino hotel reading this and I read it in one sitting. And I don't know if it was just because I was in like the land of debauchery while I was reading this that amplified the experience, but yeah, this was amazing. This was my best book of the year. It's disturbing, funny, absurd, surreal. It's a crazy time. Okay guys, those were my best books of 
of 2023. So you can like this video if you want, comment, subscribe if you want. I would love to have you. And let me know what your best books of 2023 have been. Did you read any of these books? Do you want to read any of these books? Let me know. I would love to hear from you. And I will see you in another video, hopefully very soon. Loved you very much. A goodbye.